I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name, and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello, listeners. This is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to another Shakespeare Anyone mini-episode. In these mini-episodes, we'll be exploring topics that are related to Shakespeare but aren't necessarily connected to whatever play we've been discussing. And they're mini because, well, they're shorter than our other episodes. They're like quartos if the regular episodes are folio editions. In today's Thanksgiving mini-episode, we'll be discussing post-colonial theory in Shakespeare. And there is a lot to discuss here. Since we haven't covered any of Shakespeare's plays that include post-colonial themes, this episode is an intro to post-colonial theory in Shakespeare, focusing on colonial imagination in The Tempest. And, as Corey was writing this episode, she realized the study of post-colonial theory in Shakespeare is so vast that we need to cover this topic as a miniseries. Subsequent episodes will discuss the colonization of Ireland, anti-Semitism in The Merchant of Venice, racism in Othello, immigrants in early modern London, 
the aftermath of colonialism, and, of course, post-colonial performance, past and present. In addition to our mini-series, we will dive deeper into this topic during our The Tempest, Othello, and Merchant of Venice series, respectively. The reason we are releasing this episode on Thanksgiving is because we believe in deconstructing and decolonizing our readings of, as we said in our trailer, this old white dude, William Shakespeare. Art is not created in a vacuum. People create the art we consume for a reason. So, let's re-examine the Renaissance man through colonialism. We also want to acknowledge Jotsna G. Singh's 2019 book, Shakespeare and Postcolonial Theory, published by Arden Shakespeare, as our primary source today. And as we'll be discussing colonialism, we will cover topics that may be triggering for some people. Please listen with care. So, now that we've covered our bases, let's dive in. Postcolonial theory is the academic critical cultural study of European colonialism and imperialism, focusing on the human consequences of the control and exploitation of colonized peoples and their lands. And boy, did England do a lot of colonizing during the last 400 years. The British Empire was composed of colonies and territories that were ruled under the United Kingdom, often through invasion and force. Some of those territories include the continental United States, Ireland and Scotland, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, India, and portions of Africa, among others. The British Empire's goal was to extend England's authority around the world, often for economic and religious purposes. The empire was at its strongest during the 18th and 19th centuries, but it didn't completely fall until the late 20th century after a series of uprisings for independence by the colonized. The British Empire also included the original 13 colonies of the United States, which leads us to Thanksgiving. Without historical context in mind and restorative justice in place, Thanksgiving celebrates the horrifying legacy of English and European colonization that led to the slaughter of the indigenous peoples and their culture. It's misleading to teach a tale of unity when, less than a generation after the supposed meal between the English pilgrim colonizers and the Wampanoags, the two groups were at war, and the American government systemically destroyed Native sovereignty. In addition, Native peoples and their allies call Thanksgiving the National Day of Mourning. If you're listening to this episode and are unsure of what to do about the Thanksgiving holiday because the history is so bleak, stick around for the end of the episode. We have suggestions about how to begin ethically celebrating this moral dilemma. So now, let's tie colonialism to our main man, William Shakespeare. But how? Shakespeare wasn't a colonizer. In fact, he never even left England, or so we have no proof of any such travels. To frame this episode, we must point out that colonialism had extraordinary consequences on the global landscape, especially for the colonized. And it feels almost inevitable that early modern England, the quote-unquote age of discovery, influenced colonialism in one way or another. So, we posit, Shakespeare, a Renaissance man, must have been influenced by colonialism to some degree. Historians generally agree that English and European colonial and imperial power against non-white, non-European peoples was at its height, like we said, during the late 18th and early 19th century. But that's not to say that imperialism was not present before, and it definitely doesn't mean that it isn't present now. I mean, gestures broadly at the everything imperial. However, in this episode, we're going to connect colonialism to Shakespeare's world and, of course, his play, The Tempest. If you remember from our intro series, the concept of the British Empire was brought to Elizabeth I by her advisor, John Dee. He advocated for the development of settlements abroad for British trade and national strength. In the coming decades, England made forays into America, including the failed Virginia colony of 1585, the first permanent English settlement, Jamestown, in 1607, and Walter Raleigh's journeys into the New World. This proto-colonialism, or shall we say, colonialism light, leads many scholars to dismiss early modern colonial discourse as irrelevant when analyzing colonization on the large scale. However, Jonathan Burton, professor of English at Whittier College, states that the, quote, representative practices of high imperialism can be sometimes found germinating in earlier periods, unquote. To put it in lay terms, 
The systems of colonization didn't come out of a vacuum. They came out of a world that imagined it into action. But to define early modern English people as colonizers as we know it today can be tricky because the British Empire was mostly engaged in something coded as trade and sea exploration. Again, our colonialism light. And again, as with all things, colonialism didn't appear out of thin air. From a post-colonial perspective, Singh argues that, quote, the cultural and literary texts and events representing interactions with non-Europeans from the early 16th century onwards bears the mark of a colonizing imagination, unquote. And this colonizing imagination is what we will discuss. But where can one find it? The colonizing imagination can be found in a diverse body of works in early modern English society, specifically travel narratives and plays. And yes, that includes Shakespeare. These works represent the cultural climate of England's global expansion in the form of commercial, cultural, and religious dimensions. Remember, England's economy was rapidly adapting from the roughly 6,000 years of feudalism to the relatively new mercantile system popularized less than 100 years before Shakespeare. Mercantilism led to trade, trade led to sea exploration, and sea exploration led to interacting with cultures other than the English, and, consequently, othering those peoples in the hopes of creating an empire, as well as cultural and religious hegemony. Through permeating tropes, fantasies, rhetorical structures, and visual images about the others, like natives in the New World, Africans in Northwest Africa, and the Irish, early modern England defined life through a binary that laid the foundation for the colonial imagination. We, the English, are this. They, the others, are that. Examples include civilization versus barbarism, white versus black, pious restraint versus uncontrolled eroticism, Christianity versus Islam. From an expansionist mindset, focusing on these non-white, non-English, non-Protestant differences made colonizing justifiable. But let's talk more about these travel narratives that influenced the colonial imagination and, likely, Shakespeare. In order to understand the prolific nature of travel writing in the period, Singh explores Richard Hakluyt's travel anthology, The Principal Navigations, Voyages, and Discoveries of the English Nation, published in 1589. Hakluyt was a clergyman, advisor to Queen Elizabeth, and a purveyor of travel accounts. In his commercial pursuits, he wrote to promote the commercial and moral superiority of the English nation. He can be seen as a, quote, potent catalyst for the exploration movement, instrumental in colonization and trading efforts, and one of the conduits for much of the short-lived information then circulating, unquote. In other words, he had clout. And that clout had consequences. For example, in Hakluyt's epistle dedicatory to Francis Walsingham, he writes of the English as, quote, stirrers abroad who have excelled all nations and people of the earth. To Hakluyt, England should competitively pursue trading advantages, including the slave trade. He wrote, quote, Now it is high time for us, England, to weigh our anchor, and with all speed to direct our course for the Atlantic Ocean, over which the Spaniards and Portuguese have made so many pleasant, prosperous, and golden voyages for the getting of slaves, for sugar, for elephants' teeth, grains, silver, gold, and other precious wares. To Hakluyt, exploration was an opportunity for England. But Hakluyt was only one travel writer in a list of English world travelers who wrote for domestic entertainment, patriotism, commercial and colonial invasion, or Protestant Christian proselytization, or forced religious conversion. These writers' depictions of the others they encountered, as well as the power dynamics they portrayed, evoked analogies in many of Shakespeare's works of colonial or proto-colonial themes. If you've never read or seen The Tempest, or if it's been a while, here's a quick synopsis. Prospero, a powerful magician, uses magic to conjure a storm and torment the survivors of a shipwreck, including the king of Naples and Prospero's treacherous brother, Antonio. Prospero's slave, the native Caliban, plots to rid himself of his master, but is thwarted by Prospero's spirit servant, Ariel. 
The king's young son, Ferdinand, falls in love with Prospero's daughter, Miranda. Prospero confronts his brother and reveals his identity as the usurped Duke of Milan. The families are reunited and all conflict is resolved. Prospero grants Ariel his freedom and prepares to leave the island. The end. Now, back to theory. If you add travel narrative's historical complexity to The Tempest, the play mirrors a travel account in its motifs of sea voyage, discovery, and encounters with a quote-unquote native. Travelers and explorers wrote of their travels during the Age of Discovery and encouraged England's quote-unquote incipient empire. Through this lens, the relationship between the play and its cultural context is apparent. For example, scholars connected William Strachey's 1610 New World Bermuda pamphlet about a shipwreck in the Caribbean to the Tempest. Like the use of the gunpowder plot in Macbeth, Shakespeare might have been thinking about this pamphlet while writing The Tempest. According to Virginia Mason Vaughan and Alden T. Vaughan, quote, the voluminous literature of European exploration was rife with tempests, wrecks, miracles, monsters, devils, and wondrous natives, but many travel narratives are overshadowed by Shakespeare's almost certain familiarity with William Strachey's pamphlet, written during and immediately after the events, and was probably read as a manuscript by many of London's cultural and political leaders. How could Shakespeare not have been influenced by this epic event? It was big news, like when the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal in 2021. In addition to Strachey's pamphlet, Prospero can be read as a colonizer. According to Paul Brown's 1985 essay, The Darkness I Acknowledge Mine, The Tempest and the Discourse of Colonialism, quote, from Prospero's initial appearance, it becomes clear that disruption was produced to create a series of problems precisely in order to affect their resolution. For Caliban, he is a colonizer whose refused offer of civilization forces him to strict discipline and enslavement. Putting it simply, if you create a problem only you can solve, you make yourself the de facto authority. If the natives do not like your authority, you assert your power through force, like colonization or enslavement. And unfortunately, Prospero's character is typically read through the benevolent colonizer trope, we here at Shakespeare Anyone can't say it any better than Francis Barker and Peter Hume in their 1985 essay, Nymphs and Reapers Heavily Vanish, The Discursive Contexts of the Tempest. The justification for Caliban's enslavement, quote, is the characteristic trope by which European colonial regimes articulated their authority over land to which they could have no conceivable legitimate claim, and its success relies on the audience's uncritical willingness to identify Prospero's voice as a direct and reliable authorial statement. Historically, European and North American critics of the play tended to listen exclusively to Prospero's voice. After all, he speaks their language. Unquote. But not everyone is open to reading Shakespeare and the Tempest through a post-colonial lens. Some scholars refute this reading because, as Singh argues, Reading the play's colonial themes implies reading it through a historical specificity that replaces its previous lens through a new lens that, we at the podcast argue, challenges white apologist feelings about Prospero. For example, scholar Douglas Bruster argues that, rather, the play is an allegory on playhouse labor, comparing Prospero to the director playwright, Miranda to the spectator, Ariel to the boy actor, and Caliban to the comedian and clown Will Kemp. In his book chapter, Quoting the Playhouse in the Tempest, Bruster emphasizes David Caston's argument that, quote, the Americanization of the Tempest may be itself an act of cultural imperialism, unquote. Now, we're not quite sure about the mental gymnastics of this logic, but as far as we can tell, a playhouse allegory and a colonialism allegory do not have to be mutually exclusive. And frankly, none of us know what Shakespeare was thinking when he wrote The Tempest. To erase a post-colonial reading, as if you know what Shakespeare was thinking, is absurd. Especially when we can surmise that he might have understood colonialism's effects because Caliban was given language that indicates this other character wants to escape colonization and get his land back. In Act 1, Scene 2, quote, This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. For I am the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king, and here you sty me in this hard rock wall so you do keep from me the rest of the island. He's not wrong. That's all the time we have today. 
So, to sum up this intro episode, early modern England's colonial imagination was a result of trade and sea exploration made possible by an emerging British empire. While Shakespeare didn't participate in proto-colonial activities directly, he and his plays might have been influenced by the travel writers who were documenting their travels, as well as the people they encountered abroad. And while it can be uncomfortable to read Shakespeare through a post-colonial lens, ignoring the possibilities of such a reading only further ignores the public discourse surrounding early modern England's ambition to colonize. And before we let you go, if you choose to celebrate Thanksgiving, we have some suggestions for celebrating the holiday that we hope makes you feel less icky. First, unlearn revisionist history and learn real history. It may be uncomfortable, but remember, Native lives over white feelings. Then discuss this history with your family and friends. Second, donate to your local tribe, either money, resources, or your time. Third, support Native activists and become an ally. Get involved in restorative justice and diversify your feed by following Native activists, organizations, and artists. Fourth, and finally, support Native businesses, art, and academia. Today, we recommend listening to the All My Relations podcast episode, Thanks Taking or Thanksgiving. And that's postcolonial theory. Keep an eye out for future postcolonial mini episodes. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Hamlet, Act 2, Scene 2, said by Hamlet, I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw.